our first night home together. How many months have I ached for this moment? How many times have I played out the beats of this scene in my head, feeding my tiny sidekick to sleep, feeling the helpless suck of his gulps as he drifts away, safe, happy, careless to the world outside. And I would sit and watch him long, long after he fell into slumber and stroke his gentle head and kiss his apple fat cheeks. It is nothing like that. I cannot dredge the dread from my soul. I'm not even sad. I'm nothing, flat, flattened as I haul myself from the bed and set Joe down in his new crib. As I tiptoe away, wincing as the loose floorboard creaks, cursing myself, cursing everything, strange fragments of ideas gather in the crevices of my mind. I can't recognize myself as the thinker of these thoughts and I stub them out before they take form. I cling to the delusion that in time, with sleep, it will come, that gut-tingling star blaze of emotion we're supposed to feel. For now, I'll just have to do the best I can. As long as he's fed and warm and safe, I'm not failing my baby, not yet. The life of a book is a peculiar thing. The word happenstance or osmosis in which the idea is first conceived, the period in which you write it and the moment you hand it over to your editor. They all represent three different stages of a journey. I never set out to write Go to Sleep or a novel on motherhood for that matter. Its inception was purely impulsive and, and completely unplanned. In, in fact, I was already three chapters into another novel. I wrote Go to Sleep in the first six months of, of motherhood and it was written in a fury, in a fever, in a sleep-starved rage. When I finished the novel, it sat on my desk for nine months, the, the length of a pregnancy, ironically, before I felt able to let it go, because in sharing it with the rest of the world, I'd be forced to revisit the, the space in which I wrote it, which was a space more black and malevolent and, and denser than, than any place I've ventured before, both creatively and emotionally. I switch the kettle on, make a brew, keep busy, try not to dwell. I sit at the kitchen table with the lights off and the curtains ajar, a bar of amber street light striking the patch of floor by my feet. I flick the radio on, some late night phone in, casting crumbs of hope to the unlovely, the unloved. A passing car lights up the room for a split second, long enough for me to spy a patch of sticky filth on the floor. I haul myself up, all size and wise, wrench the tap on and prepare a stinking hot dental mix, spiked with an extra slug of bleach. I scrub and scrub, get right down on my knees and scour the corners of the kitchen, under the fridge, everywhere. The effort seems to work loosen with the knots in my head, so I continue, blitzing all the kitchen surfaces, the door handles, the fridge, the bin, the microwave, till everything is pristine and perfect, as though Joe didn't exist. I've come to realise that, as a writer, I only ever write from a position of, of anger or, or disquiet, and go to sleep was a full frontal attack. It was a rage against motherhood and the, the silence it imposed on me. It was also a love letter to my son. On buses, on park benches, in the deserted town centre at the crack of dawn and, and, and down by the riverfront, it poured out of me in, in one violent surge. It started life as um, a suicide letter from a mother to her baby, desperately protesting a love, but desperate enough to, to take her own life. And then, as I began to get sleep and, and my depression lifted, it, it morphed into a novel. It's middle-class cast and urban setting are very different from my own circumstances, and, and Rachel Massey's journey is ultimately more, more brutal and, and, and bleaker than, than mine, but it's underpinned by a darkness. That's my darkness. I can barely recall the period in which I wrote Go to Sleep Now, or the deranged and wild-eyed woman that pushed a pram through the streets at all hours. And I think it's raw and chaotic energy, and it's blurring of the real and the hallucinatory really reflects the kind of manic crashes and surges of the first few 
weeks and months. As a piece of art, I think it's probably the most honest thing I've ever written. And it was written from the front line of motherhood and it was also written from the frontiers of madness. And I guess if I'd waited a year or even six months to write it, I probably wouldn't have written it at all. Hopeful, I'll sleep now. I make my way to the bathroom. Avoid myself in the mirror. Give my teeth a cursory brush. I can't keep my eyes open. It feels like I could fall into the deepest, loveliest sleep, right where I am now. I head for the bedroom, forgetting the loose floorboard. I freeze for an instant, bite hard on my lip, promise I'll nail it down first thing tomorrow and lower myself into the bed. Please sleep, Joe. Please sleep for Mama. The headboard creaks as my head hits the pillow. I hold my breath. He snorts. I lie dead still, scared to exhale, afraid to blink. Please, Joe. Please sleep. Please don't wake. I see his hand reach up, a little fist reaching out for me. I want to smack it away. Not now, Joe. Let me sleep. Let me sleep. 